Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. The first week when we started this series on the Lord's Prayer, we looked at the fact that we have to put first things first. And we have the jar, remember, with stone and little stones, and, and we graphically or picturesquely saw the uh, big stones that they, if we waited until the important things, the big stones, we couldn't get them in. But if we put them in first, then things took on their priority and things were much better in our lives. Then last week, we talked about Calvary and name. In other words, enhancing the reputation of God, living our lives in such a way that we do not, that God does not have to be ashamed of us and that other people don't look at us and say, man, they must have a puny God or they must have a God who doesn't care very much or they must have a God who is not important because look at how these Christians are treating each other and how Christians are treating their relationship with God. So we look at the second aspect of hallowing the name, of enhancing the reputation. Are you beginning to get a picture that the first half of the Lord's Prayer, as it appears in the New Testament, the first half of the Lord's Prayer is focused on who God is. The focus is not on us. Remember, I quoted one of the writers by the name of Rick Warren, who said, it's not about you. And then sort of paraphrasing the campaign of 1992, he said, it's not about you, it's about God, stupid. And in fact, we often have to remind ourselves again and again and again, that it's not about us, but it is about our Lord Jesus Christ and what He has done for us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we know that You love us. And we also have the tendency to take advantage of You and at other times to ignore You. And so we ask as we study your word as we study the prayer that you have taught us, that we begin to recognize where you are in our lives and where we need to place you in our lives. We need to recognize, Lord, that you are the one that shall be hallowed and held holy in our lives. So now as we continue to read your word, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our Lord and our Redeemer. Amen. Even though there are a number of people here who have lived a long time, I'm wondering whether there's anyone here who remembers the October 30th, 1938 radio broadcast from CBS by Orson Welles. Is there anyone who remembers that? Mike, did you remember that? <laughs> nobody raised your hand. Okay, nobody remembered it. Well, let me just briefly mention it. On October 30th, the Halloween evening, October 30th, the Halloween, just a few days before Halloween, Orson Welles put together a program that was broadcast by radio. Remember now, this is in the shadow of World War II. Many people expected World War II to begin at any time. And there were many people who were afraid that they were going to be invaded, and many people were so afraid that they were taking measures to prevent that kind of invasion. Orson Welles, on October 30th, took a play or a novel by H.G. Wells, No Relationship, which was called Wars of the World. And he put on this program where he had invited a professor from Princeton, all fictitious, of course, a professor from, from Princeton and other people, and they together presented an invasion which was occurring at the moment of the broadcast by the Martians who were coming into this world and attacking the world. And they took the various portions of the book and rather than just reading them, they used them as news bulletins and made it appear as if this were really happening right then and there. And this was so realistic to so many people that panic broke out on the East Coast People were running away, trying to get away from New York City where apparently the Martians were landing and had decimated the American army and were now going to take over the rest of the United States. And people were afraid because they really believed that there was a war of the worlds. Now I'd like to suggest to us that when you and I talk about spiritual warfare, 
we have the tendency to put it in the same category as the play World of the War of the Worlds was the CBS news representation. But listen with me to the text that we find in Ephesians chapter 6. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God. May I suggest that most people and most modern theologians do not really believe that Satan exists. We may talk about him, we may jokes about him, but I'm afraid that we have sort of delegated or relegated this particular text as if it really were true. And I want to suggest the opposite. In fact, I want to state the opposite. I want us to recognize that pursuant to the Bible, we are engaged in a spiritual struggle that's even too weak. We're engaged in spiritual warfare. We are engaged in a warfare that is so real that we can't even allow ourselves to think about it. And therefore, we often act as if there were no contending powers out there who were contending with us in the kingdom of God. And yet scripture is full of the fact that there's a kingdom of God and there's a kingdom which is controlled by the prince of this world. And unless we begin to recognize it, we will miss so many of the events that occur which have a tendency to drag us down. We will miss them because we think all those are just events that are going on in the world. Now just remember, not too long after, or in fact at the same time as the War of the Worlds was going on on October 30th, 1938, Hitler was amassing in an army that was attacking. And I want to state right here now that in my opinion, Satan was behind that. I cannot help but believe that Hitler was an agent of Satan. Now I don't know whether he actually went out and talked to Satan, I don't know whether he had some kind of a dance that was going on. I don't believe that he necessarily did it that way, that he was belonged to some kind of cubby. But I do believe that the power of evil was at work in a mighty way that had incredible evil consequences. And I want to also, I also state that I think the same dynamics are occurring in the world today. Not because you might have disagreed or agree with a particular political philosophy, but because we know from Scripture, we've been told by God Himself that there is an evil out there which is contending with the good that we, for our own sake, need to pray. Your kingdom come. We don't need to pray that for God. We don't need to pray to God and say, God, we now give you permission. We need to pray your kingdom come because we are so easily subsumed or so overpowered or seduced into believing that this world is really the best there is. And we don't need to believe for it. My mother used to have a saying that unfortunately she used with me quite often, and that was if you give the devil your little kingdom, he'll take your whole hand. And you don't want him. Give the devil your little finger. He'll take your whole hand. And that's what we're talking about. When we're talking about your kingdom come, we're asking God to bring his kingdom to fruition in this world because the reality is that the evil and the Satan, Satan in this evil will destroy us. And we need, we need our Lord Jesus Christ to rule our hearts. So as we continue today to talk about that your kingdom come, next week we're talking about your will be done. Let's for a moment just take a look at this. When the word kingdom is used in scripture, it's sort of used in two different ways. Most of us think about a kingdom as a place, some piece of geography. 
But the Bible most often uses the term kingdom in a different way. It uses it to identify a particular rule or a particular reign. But let me get illustrate it this way. This country is governed by the President of the United States. And then there's a certain geography here. But that doesn't mean that the rule and reign doesn't extend beyond the geography of the United States. If there's a soldier, for example, who is in Africa or Europe, that soldier is still under the rule of the President of the United States as Commander-in-Chief, even if that person is not geographically located, physically located, in the geography which we call the United States. And so it is with the rule and the kingdom of God. The rule and reign of God is not necessarily located in a particular geography, but it is a rule that is still applicable to us, that still governs us, that we still have to search out and have to live by because if we want to be the followers of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so the kingdom is used then in a way that talks about the rule and reign. reign. Now the will of God, and we'll get into more of that next week, the will of God is really a particularized version. In other words, the rule of God encompasses the whole universe, everything that is created and uncreated. But when you particularize it, when you apply it to specific situations, that's then the will of God, the will of God for you personally. Have you talked about that with your children? What is the, your, God's will for them? What is God's will for you? Have you talked to each other about God's will for you in your lives, in your families, in your work? You see, the will of God applies the kingdom of God in particular situations, either personally, or in our relationships, in our congregations, in our communities. And so that's the difference between the two. But there is one key that we need to understand. And the key to understanding the kingdom of God is that you and I so easily slip into a mode of prayer that starts off with who we are and ends with who we are. In other words, let's picture it this way. The question that I most often ask is, what can God do for me? Or, how can I get God to do something for me? I would like to have more financial security. So I pray, oh Lord Jesus, you know my financial situation. You know the problems that we're having. You know the difficulties that we're having. So would you please make it possible for us? Bring us somebody. Let me win the lottery. Some people pray that way. We used to have a person in the congregation that I served, and he used to pray every day. We had an open, we had an open prayer time. Every Sunday he would pray, God grant me my special favor. God grant me my special favor. And finally I just had it. I said, you know, Jim, I said, what, what's your special favor? I said, I'm dying to know. He said, I have a horse that's called Faith Special Favor, and I want that horse to win. You know? <laughs> and even though, you know, that is humorous and an issue, it is. We ourselves do the same thing. We are going to God and say, God, grant. You know, if we had entitled the sermon series, How Do You Get God to Do What You Want Him to Do? We probably have a lot more people. How do you get God to do what you want him to do? That's how often, that's how we so often start. Picture it this way. Can you imagine? I tried to find out. Google this and I couldn't get a good answer. I tried to find out what would happen if the earth would go off of its orbit. If the earth would no longer go on the same path around the sun as it has been going around. Well, what would happen if the moon were to get out of its orbit and would start going around the earth in a different way than it is going around? And the only thing I could find is that most people were saying that there probably would be some kind of disaster. There would be some kind of a fall. That the gravitational pull would send the earth spinning off in some direction. To me, to me that's a picture of what you and I have done with prayer. We have taken our lives, which should have as, their, as its center, as the, our life center, Jesus Christ, and we have made ourselves the center. 
We have taken ourselves and we have changed the order of our creation. We were created in order to glorify God. And we have decided that we're going to get into a little different order. Not just a little bit, Lord, just a little bit. Let me have some attention. And so that orbit centers around us again and again and again. What prayer is, is getting the orbit correct. Getting us centered around our Lord Jesus Christ. Getting us centered around our orbit. The reason the Lord's Prayer has the first three petitions deal, or the reason they deal with uh, God Himself, is because we need to be reminded that God is the center of our lives. And not we. <clears throat> not our spouses. Not any other human being. As wonderful as they might be. Not even any activity. Not even going to church. Not even this congregation. Not even this building. Nothing is more important than centering our lives around Jesus Christ so that we're in the right orbit. Because if we don't, and if we aren't in the right orbit, our lives are going to fly apart. It will be a disaster sooner or later. And you know the story of the triumphal entry of Jesus at the time that we celebrated in Palm Sunday. What Jesus is really saying there in a very immodest but humble way, riding on a donkey, he is really saying to the people, you can either crown me or kill me. You can't have it in between. You can either crown Jesus in your life or you can kill him. You can't live in an in-between world. Whereas living in an in-between world is to just kill him slowly rather than all at once. Remember the young rich ruler? Now here's another example. He comes and he asks Jesus the right question. How can I get into the kingdom of God? He says eternal life, but in the gospel that's equivalent. In fact, Jesus later on says he wants to know how to get into the kingdom of God. He comes and asks the question, how can I get into the kingdom of God? He's asking the right question. And he asks the right person. He asks Jesus Christ. And he gets the right answer. And the answer is to stop focusing and centering his life on himself, but to center on what God is asking him to do, which in this case is to give up his center, which was to find all security in his possessions. Now, I don't know where you are. What you place at the center of your life. And I'm not suggesting that all of us are renegades who are running around just focusing on ourselves that we never focus on God or never focus on anyone else. But it's so easy to stop focusing on Jesus and yet so important that we do so. The father came home. He'd been working all day and he just wanted to relax his wife hadn't come home yet and sits down in his chair and his little girl, Vanessa, comes to him and says, Dad, he says, Let, let's play together. And he says, oh, honey, he says, I am so tired. I don't want to do that right now. Do you mind if, if we just sit here for a while? And she goes off and two or three minutes later she comes back and asks the same question. And finally, after about the third or fourth time of this, the dad is reading a magazine, sees there's a picture of the world and he pulls it out. And he tears it into small pieces and he hands the pieces to her and he says, Here, Vanessa, go and put, a, put back the picture of the world. And she goes off and two or three minutes she's back and she has the picture of the world all done. And he looks at her and he says, How did you do that? And she says, Well, on the back there was a picture of Jesus. And once you put him together, the world will follow. Where is he? Where is he now? 